Speaking on Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom, the best the king has to offer. Today's topic, the need for mature saints. From the book of Genesis, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, New King James Version, the Bible reads, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now, that scripture context is of profound magnitude. It's deep. It is weighty with the splendor of God, and it expresses an unfathomable amount of revelation knowledge that many believers miss. I like to relate the verse of scripture that says, deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. That's Psalm 42 and 7. I like to relate that to scriptures like the one that we just read because they contain secrets. They contain mysteries of which Holy Spirit is willing to reveal to any believer who sincerely desire Holy Spirit revelation of the Word of God and makes himself available to receive it. As a child and young adult growing up in the Holiness Church my family attended, the old saints would sing a song called, We've Come This Far By Faith, Leaning On The Lord. Today, many saints not only sing that song, but they also pray it to the Lord. They say, Lord, just let me lean on you because I can't walk this out by myself. Another version of this song that has had greater success in recent years is Let Me Lean On You. Over the years, both songs have had many variations. Songs like these have survived because they have constantly been upgraded to meet the cultural, technological, and innovative times and lifestyles in which we live. But the one thing that has continued to move forward with it is a steady level of unbelief or immaturity of our lifestyles as Christians. Now, there's nothing wrong with leaning on Jesus. I have very real memories of times I had to do just that. But those times were also seasons of consistent spiritual growth as well. As a novice, a new believer, I didn't yet possess the faith to do anything but lean on Jesus. I had to lean on him for just about everything, especially when the devil would bombard my mind with all the pleasures of the world that I was missing. So it really is okay for a new believer to lean on Jesus. And because spiritual maturity involves the planting of the word in one's heart, it begins as a seed and requires proper spiritual cultivation before the word planted is activated to produce fruit. God really does want to bring forth those deep-seated anointings and powers that are within you. Here's the problem. Many saints have been saved for decades and have not grown up in Christ as spiritually mature saints. You see, God will sometimes manifest supernatural feats for a new believer as a beginning to building their faith and trust in him. But he's too wise to lead them in that place because faith grows. It comes by hearing. In hearing, being sensitive to what is heard with an attentive ear to receive and obey or act on it by the word of God. As Paul describes in Romans 10, 17, God does not want his children to be babes in Christ all of their Christian life. So he allows situations that will present the opportunity to trust them. As the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, and I believe that writer to be Paul, it says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation though we speak in this manner. Paul's exhortation to spiritual maturity was not lost in any of his epistles. He was a constant advocate of spiritual growth for the saints, and he chastised the Hebrews for not being spiritually mature when they should have been because many were weary and wanted to give up on their Christian way of life. Let's take a look at that. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. 
And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their spiritual senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The saints that Apostle Paul is speaking to were not recent converts. They'd been believers for quite some time, yet they needed to be taught again. This implies that these believers had taken positive steps toward becoming spiritually mature Christians, and for lack of spiritual exercise, a consistent regimen of trusting God and mixing his word by faith, they either stopped growing or slipped back to the place where they were when they first accepted Christ. The word again carries significant weight in verse 12 of the scripture that we just read because it suggests a reverse direction or to an original starting point back to a former place or state. The Greek word translated again in that context is palin, which means oscillatory repetition, anew, of place, back, of time, once more, do over, do again. So that scripture context paints us a picture of adult saints who look and carry on like babies who have yet to be weaned from milk. And because they are babes in Christ, they also are unskilled in the word of righteousness, the word of God says. They have not developed the spiritual skill of how to weld the sword of righteousness. Baby Christians can never become wise master builders. They have to mature, be weaned from the first principles of the oracles of God, and consume solid food, which is advanced teaching of the word of God that they hear and obey by faith. Advanced teaching belongs to spiritually mature saints those who show steady growth because they consistently exercise their spirit man with the word of God. Remember, inconsistency lies the power. Spiritually mature saints consistently use, they hear, study, and act in faith on the word of God. Paul lets us know that we cannot properly discern between good and evil unless our spiritual senses are consistently exercised by our continuous use of the word of God. The spiritually mature have progressed in their spiritual life and have become believers who exercise sound judgment and discernment. Now, as I stated earlier, there is a time to lean on Jesus, most assuredly as a novice in the Christian faith, but also in times when it seems you are overwhelmed with an extended barrage of misfortune or sorrow or calamity. That is a time when even spiritually mature believers tend to, quote, lean on Jesus, end quote. But listen, they tend to recover quickly as well. It's like laying in the bosom or on the breast of Jesus for immediate strength, energy, and recovery of their faith. They remember who they are in and through him, and they pick themselves up, recover their faith, and resume their walk with him. As the word of God says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. John was very close to Jesus, and at times he would lean on Jesus' breast. But this was not done so much because John was a novice. It was more about the intimacy attached to his relationship with Jesus. John was somewhat discouraged at times, and one of those times took place at the Last Supper, prior to Judas' portrayal of Jesus. This was a time when John leaned on Jesus, not from a position of fear and unbelief, but from a relational position born out of intimacy. Let's take a look at that. John chapter 13, verses 21 through 26 from the New King James Version. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Let's take a look at John 21 and 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? 
Now, the Greek word translated for lean in those texts of scripture is anapipto, which means to fall back on, to lean back. John was actually lying back, leaning back on Jesus' breast. So I know what today's saint mean when he or she says, I'm leaning on Jesus. It's simply saying, I can't get through this situation, this trouble, this calamity without you, Jesus. He or she is saying, Lord, I trust you to bring me out of this or do it for me. But that's not biblical faith. Again, the problem here is that these are requests void of faith or complete trust in God. They are likened to wishing or hoping God rescues them without the required ingredients added to the request of supplication. Those are the ingredients, the word of God and your faith in the word of God. Listen to what the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.1. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. We are workers together with them. The prophet Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet who mourned over Jerusalem's sorrowful plight. He lamented, crying in despair over the destruction of Jerusalem and its desolation due to the grievous sins of the people. Jeremiah prayed for mercy, and his prayer is one of which I suppose some would say Jeremiah leaned on the Lord. Even so, Jeremiah did not allow this terrible tragedy to put him in a faithless quagmire. He cried to God in despair, but he recovered himself by remembering who and what he was in God. Let's take a look at that in Lamentations chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 and then we'll move forward to verses 17 and 18 from the New King James Version. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. Now let's fast forward to verses 17 and 18. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Wow. Obviously, That is a prayer of one who is grief-stricken, but it is more of a complaint consisting of Jeremiah's plight as a consequence of the destruction of Jerusalem, which the Lord allowed at the hands of Babylon. He starts out praying as if God is the enemy, but what an amazing recovery of Jeremiah's faith. Let's take a look at that, the recovery. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Remember my affliction and my roaming the wormwood, and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wow, what a remarkable recovery. What a remarkable statement of faith by the prophet Jeremiah, especially verses 22 and 23. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Notice that Jeremiah had to recall to his mind those times when he had gone through afflictions and hard times prior to the siege of Jerusalem. Notwithstanding the immediate horror and terror of what Jeremiah was experiencing, along with what seemed to be God's silence in not answering his prayers to save Jerusalem and allowing the destruction, Jeremiah remembered all the proof of God's past compassions and faithfulness. He refused to give up hope, and he attached his faith to God's faithfulness. Though Jeremiah's life was steeped in affliction, by faith he maintained the Lord as his inheritance. He had faith in God's faithfulness to his own word. Jeremiah's ability to wait on God further points out the advantage or leverage that saints have through their God-inbred ability to be patient. God is a good God, and his goodness is found even when we are distressed because of trouble or calamity. During these times, we must earnestly worship or seek God and wait for his deliverance. 
This isn't something we can do half-heartedly. We must encourage ourselves in the Lord and endure the afflictions and tribulations patiently, without complaint. See, this is where real faith meets the problem. It is a total submission to God in faith. Real faith doesn't struggle to produce results through selfish or fleshly means. Real faith simply rests and lets our Heavenly Father do the work. Jesus said, my Father, he does the work. There are times also when saints find themselves leaning on their own sense knowledge. King Solomon, the earthly king of all wisdom, points out to us the vain glory associated with doing so. It is impossible for believers to use their human insight or intelligence when standing in faith for the wisdom of God. We must learn the righteous ways of our Heavenly Father, our Abba, and trust Him completely, for He sees all and knows all. Let's make sure we understand that from Scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5-8, through 8, New King James Version. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Saints are God's spiritual architects. We are his master builders whom he has placed on earth to build and advance his kingdom. Amen. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So then, our Heavenly Father has equipped his spiritually mature sons and daughters with his nature, power, and glory to build upon the foundation of his dear son, to walk with him as his representatives on earth, not to lean on him or our own understanding. Apostle Paul said, we should take heed how we build. Jesus was not a weak, immature son of God. He was strong, mature, and he learned obedience through the things, the persecutions, the afflictions, the hatred, and the mocking that he suffered. Yet Jesus didn't simply lean on his father expecting him to do the work of bringing salvation to all people without his help, without Jesus' working together with him. Jesus provided the passion to willingly obey his father, and his father supplied the resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. We too, saints, must be perfected or fitted for completion of our kingdom assignment through the things that we definitely will require us to endure for Christ's sake in the Gospels by walking with God in faith and not leaning on him, expecting that he's just going to make everything all right. As we grow spiritually, we will learn how to walk with God, as Enoch did. We will learn how to stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and walk and talk with God, and we will be transformed to become the author of our kingdom purpose. Watch this. And when we walk and talk with God, not just in the cool of the day, as we read in scripture from Genesis 3 and 8, but all day because he lives in us. God only showed up in the cool of the day to talk to Adam and Eve because they had disobeyed him. Prior to their disobedience, God walked and talked in them. Yeah, their disobedience expelled God from walking in them and forced him to manifest himself outside of them. This is why God showed up physically walking in the garden in the cool of the day. <laughs> Could it be that God showed up in the cool of the day after his anger or at the very least his displeasure with Adam and Eve had subsided? Hmm. Well, <laughs> may our sincere desire be to reflect our loyalty, devotion, and faithful commitment to our wise master builder, Jesus Christ, by walking with him as spiritually mature saints, as opposed to leaning on him as baby Christians. Be assured, baby Christians can never become wise master builders. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when we drop new episodes. On our next episode, we'll discuss mature saints walk with God. Thanks for joining me. I hope you will join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.